Hello. Hey, Andrew. <laughs> How's it going? Good. How are you doing today? Good. Good, good. <laughs> hmm. Really cold up here. How's it? Uh, How is it down there in yeah, Iowa? Yeah, it's we're neighbors. My <laughs> <laughs> all the pipes in my house froze solid for like three days. So that was fun. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, boy, that's not fun. It's fine. It's OK now. It's not quite back to normal, but yeah, it's OK. Chilly out. It's a bit nippy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well. Part of living up north, right? right? <laughs> Spontaneous tumo, though. That's all right. Yeah, that's right. There's, there's one method to <laughs> unfreeze those pipes, right? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So you yeah, have a bummer. new book out called The Frog. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, uh, I think last time uh, you interviewed me, I had held up the manuscript. It was in, I was working on the final draft at that time. So yeah. this is it. Excellent. The Frog, a spiritual autobiography spanning many lifetimes. Beautiful. So it's a, it's a hefty book. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, it's a good. It's good but yeah. uh, it, it kind of had to be this long. I, I kept uh, trying to whittle it down and it was like, no, it's got to, I got to have more, got to have more. <laughs> so They can whittle so, it down when they make the movie out of it, right? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what kind of movie that would be. <laughs> Wonder what actor will play you. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, that's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm rather proud of it. It, uh, Cool. It, uh, it was a very challenging work and um, uh, you know I've been I've been writing for 40 years it hasn't been how I've been making a living but I I in my spare time I've been working on lots of things since Excellent. I was young and um, this was uh, something that I had the idea that I could uh, write something in more of a contemporary style. I'm a big uh, Kurt Vonnegut fan. And so I, I, you, reading this book, you, you, uh, you, you see that because so there's there, a good amount of humor in there as well. A right? lot of humor, a lot of, lot of little vignettes, a lot of, uh, you know, it seems like it's serious. All of a sudden it's a joke, you know, beautiful. <laughs> But, you know, I, that's kind of what spiritual practice yeah, is like, you know, if, say, yeah. if you take yourself too seriously, um, you know, it's just not, it's not the same, you know, you got to be able to let it go. You got to oh, be able man. to laugh about things, laugh about yourself, yeah. you know, laugh about this ego that we create. It's out so of therapeutic. It's so energetically healing. It's so... Yes. You know, I have friends that do this, that just go around town cracking jokes to people and just trying to lighten it up. And it's, it's such yeah. a powerfully alchemically transformative thing to just exactly. do it random strangers yep. and just transmute yep. that energy. It's great. Yeah. Well, you can't, uh, you can't uh, stay angry for, for long if, if somebody makes you laugh. Yeah, <laughs> you know, that's just, true too. It's yeah. a, whew, gone. And um, that's not to say that this book isn't uh, isn't serious. I mean, it's right. it's very serious, uh, and it's um, a very honest uh, appraisal of a spiritual path. Uh, so I mean, it's it's like you know, I'm I'm talking about my spiritual path, warts and all, uh, and in depth and in detail including my uh, near-death experience, right. which was a very, very important aspect of my spiritual path. And right. so, um, you know, basically I'm, I'm looking at past lifetimes and lifetime after lifetime of rebirth and continuation of, of, a, um, of a spiritual path. And uh, sometimes uh, it's, you know, I get derailed for a lifetime and then come back. There's karma that brings you back. You know, you've got, you set things in motion. And, um, and so this, this spiritual path starts with a memory that I, I was able to discover through meditation 
of uh, I was trying to find out uh, what what was I doing when Buddha Shakyamuni walked the earth 2,600 years ago? Where was I? Did I know him? I, and on I was my ego was saying, "Ooh, I hope I was one of his disciples or some somebody really close to him," you know. <laughs> And so, because it, it felt like there was a familiarity, like there was something there that I, I must have, you know, had some connection. And so, so my, my, uh, you know, my egotistical self was sort of inventing all these ideas. And so I started to look back at my past lives and you can do that through meditation. You know, you just, you just start by trying to remember today, remember yesterday, all the way back to the day you were born. And then the moment before that, when you were a different person, you know, completely different person. And then following that stream of consciousness throughout lifetime after lifetime. And then you can, you can see back as far as you want. You know, this is something that people do. And it's not a, not a, super important thing to do with spiritual practice. In fact, it could be a, a problem. It could be a hindrance. Distraction, kind of like a parlor trick or a using of a siddhi type thing. Yeah, you could you could even knowing things yeah. that were forgotten sometimes for a reason, but not always. But if you have access to yeah, it, then things you, know, you hey. let go and now you're bringing them back and it's like, oh, why, I see. why are you doing kinda, it? You kind know? of reinviting the energetic attachments a little bit. Yeah, by, so you got to okay. do it kind of a good point. Carefully, it's a very good a point. Bit, but Anyhow, I look back lifetime after life. I remember the moment I was born and verify that with both my parents uh, independently. And they both said, oh, your, your father must have said something to you. And oh, your mother must have sent some, said something to you because that's what it was. And I'm like, no, I remember it. I remember yeah. that I was when I was born in this lifetime, I remember my parents singing. Right. And they said, how could you remember that? That was just right after you were born. I said, yeah, you weren't just singing. You were really hamming it up. You were, you were two parents in love. And, you know, mom was groggy and she was still singing. And, and they were like, beautiful. you can't remember that. And I was annoyed. It was, it was I, sort of taken it as a really beautiful thing, right? Yeah. But I was annoyed with them. Right. <laughs> And then I look back to my last moment in the past life and discovered that, oh, my parents were singing just before my death. Yeah. And, and I was killed by a military action. Boom. I was annoyed with them because I wanted to run away as far as right. possible. Well, in the next minute, which was, you know, two or three years later, I'm not exactly sure. Um, you know, I was born on the other side of the world and my parents were singing. And I remember you telling and me that I was story annoyed with them. last time because we were talking Did about I? it because you were saying yeah. basically the la one of the last thoughts you had was I want to get as far away from here as possible because you were trying to evade yeah. the, the bombs being dropped in the valley. And, yeah, and you thought, I want to get as far away from here as possible. And you're annoyed by the parents singing. And then your next memory is you're being born on the opposite side of the world. Your parents are singing and annoying you because you picked yes. up right where you left off. <laughs> and, Just, and that's but what you got your mean. wish too the other side of the planet yeah. <laughs> and, that, and that's what these uh, what llamas will teach you about death is that the last thought in your previous life yeah. is the first thought in uh -huh. in this life and i, I get it because yeah. it's that stream of consciousness so there's a seamless continuity even yeah. though it's this timelessness because it's like you said it could have been years could have been who knows yeah. And time works differently than we think. And, you know, I know your first book was called Timeless Luminosity. Yes. And this one's called The Frog. So what's what's the main difference between what's the content in Timeless Luminosity and the content in The Frog? Well, uh, Timeless Luminosity, um, lots of people have been asking me to talk about this book. Uh, this was uh, basically the, the inspiration here was um, after my near-death experience, I wanted to I wanted to not only explain what my near-death experience was, and that was in 2016, but I also wanted to write poetry. And I, I did this secretly, didn't tell anybody about it at first, thinking I'm just gonna burn it in a bonfire when I'm done. But, mm. but um, anyhow, I started writing it and, uh, and uh, I had some different people, family, friends, 
you know, say, don't burn your manuscript this time, because that was my typical thing. I'd mm. work on something and then I'd burn it. It's like, you know? a, it's like a Tibetan sand painting. <laughs> yeah. yep. Sweep it into the river. Yeah, yep. I mean, just, just but then some of us take, you know, yep. digital photographs of the sand mandala and put it behind some plexiglass at the airport. And that's nice, yep. too. Yep. So this is um, the, the main point of this book is to inspire people to awaken mm. through explaining the death experience and that that truth that we discover when we die. The Dharmakaya. The Dharmakaya, the Sambhogakaya, the Nirmanakaya. You know, this whole, this whole experience, um, I explain that in this book. So, um, but it's 112 poems in here too. So, I mean, the, the poetry I think was, was kind of the main point of this book was, you know, write some poetry that really inspires people to practice, to do and spiritual they gather practice. the bodhicitta and the, yes, yeah. yes, to really, to really just decide to awaken. And it's, it was so obvious after my near death experience that, well, we can awaken anytime we want. It's not like, you know, it's not like you have to go to a monastery and sit on top of a mountain. It's like, no, just your regular life. You can, you can awaken. Yeah. And so the poetry is meant to inspire that. And to also, uh, a lot of it is um, little meditations on death and our real condition. So Excellent. it's, it, you know, it has a lot to do with non-duality and and uh, this, this illusion that we call self, this illusion that we, uh, we fabricate our entire reality, we don't even realize that right. it's more like a dream than it is anything solid. And, um, you know, and one of the things that I learned when I passed through the death bardo is that, um, that death is that, that luminous, the timeless luminosity, as I call it, dharmakaya, that's more real than anything we experience in our daily life. Yeah. And people often ask, well, how do you know you weren't dreaming? Well, it's like, how do you know you're not dreaming in your daily life? Because, right. because it certainly you know, when I came back from death, this world seemed like a big illusion to me. It seemed like a shadow. A yeah, it was compared to just, that, sure. It was just a dull place and it was right. nothing substantial about it. And, you know, the whole, I was, became very confident that, you know, our material existence is just, you know, it's just, it's just like a big dream is what it is. Yeah. It's not really any difference between our dreams and our daily life. Right. So, so, um, you know, and I, I think that when, when we die, there's this raw exposure to reality as it is. And it's not something we can really explain. You can't even point to it because it's, it's not that that's, it's nothing, but it's not nothing also. And it's, mm -hmm. It's not not nothing. <laughs> you know? Yeah, the way the way I, mean, I put it recently is I said, "What is it that's aware of emptiness?" Yeah, yeah. I mean, what is <laughs> what is that, that's a, something that a lot of people will ask is, you know, what what uh, what is that that's aware? Well, it's yeah. it's a fabrication and an appearance. We we fabricate that thing, you know, and it's not really a thing. You know, yeah. it's this consciousness that we we fabricate where we become a figment of our own imagination yeah you know and and it's it's kind of easy to get confused about that because you can you know you could say well it's nothing well no no it's not nothing because something there's is something, happening there's, there's something, something aware there. of that nothing yeah, <laughs> yeah there's something aware of that nothing uh you may not you will never be able to find that thing that's aware yeah. of that nothing right or that appearance or this person or this ego or the stream of consciousness i mean how do you find that well yeah. i i don't i don't think you do i don't i don't think it's something we can find you know yeah, it's that mysterious. It's it's perpetually behind the scenes of what we're able to grasp yeah. because of its very nature. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's a it's a um, 
to understand it, you have to understand what is beyond belief, what is beyond concept. So how do you explain that to someone without sounding like you're absolutely stark raving mad? You know, well, it's funny because when a sage <laughs> talks to a sage about this, they're just like, yeah, of course. Yeah, obviously. Of course. You know? Yes. But when yes. you talk to a seeker about it, like I like I don't get what you're trying to. Yeah. And it's like and, it, even when you give very clear pointing out instructions, the seeking mind always skips right past the. Like if you use the word awareness or whatever, they'll, they'll skip right past that and go looking for instead of. Yeah. Yeah, a typical person will create definitions for everything. Right. And, but the answer is not found in a definition or, or a concept. It's ridiculously simple. Right. But, That's why it's missed. Yeah. And, you know, and I mean, it's a, uh, it's one of those things that, you know, you, you, you try to explain how, how can something be non conceptual? And people try to come up with more concepts yeah, to explain. Word concepts to explain the non-conceptual, ineffable. <laughs> yes. And, and you can't point to it. You can't define it. You can't, you can't, uh, you know, you could write a thousand volumes of books as to what yeah. is ultimate reality and none of them would scrape the surface. You know, it's just <laughs> the only thing. Might even lead uh, you away from it if you overdo it. Yeah. Oh, easily. Yeah. People, people fall into that intellectual trap by really overanalyzing what it is instead of looking at it through direct experience through spiritual practice so um i i explained that in this this book thoroughly um about about various traps that we can fall into and in, the intellectual trap is a deadly one because yeah man so many brilliant people come right up to the cusp exactly of realization like Descartes, for example, yep. doubted yeah. everything except for that last step. He couldn't take it. And I was in that boat for many years. So I, I understand, you know, yeah, yep. totally. Yeah. You, you get to that, the, the precipice of that. And then instead of just relaxing, a person tends to cling even tighter Yeah. and grasp at all right. of those, uh, different, um, ideas that they've been accumulating last ditch stuff. attempt to keep oh, itself together don't, yeah. don't want to let any of this go because i've been working yeah. on this for a whole lifetime especially because you know? it's so close to dissolving and it really gets scared yeah. yep yeah. and the answer is poof let it go yeah <laughs> Just that, was, about it. that was one of the things for me you know that was where my my identity was still attached and tethered was uh via philosophy and music so i had the the creative hook like okay i'm mm -hmm like a crutch for the, like an insecurity yeah. crutch for the ego like oh well now i'm important enough because i'm this but then the intellectual side i was so overly identified with the mind itself like oh yeah. i'm the cleverest guy in the room and i at least i have that you know it's like another one of those ego crutches <laughs> like right. well, what do you have okay well, at least i have this right. and so right. it, it just didn't want to get get rid of the the identity of being intellectual or being right. clever or intelligence itself being uh, somehow a good thing inherently and uh, now afterwards, I, I would say things like, you know, awakening doesn't feel like intelligence. It doesn't feel like that, that intellectual no. weirdness. It's very different. <laughs> yeah, it's, it is. It's very different. Um, it's uh, not necessary to be intelligent to awaken. Right. You just need to be able to relax. And the only reason there's some, I, uh, there's some correlation between sages tending to be more intelligent than average i think is simply because if you're intelligent you're going to suffer more and if you suffer more you're going to seek harder and want it more and need it to happen quicker to end the suffering i think it's the only reason it's not that uh, you're right though that i think it's not that awakening requires a certain amount of intelligence or anything like that because you know every animal is in that state except the humans for the most part you know yeah. or every small child or yeah, yeah. It's it, yeah, it, you know, I, like it's like when you're first born, you're more, uh, you're more in in a state that's more conducive to awakening. Or when you die, you're in a mm. state that's more conducive yeah. to awakening. So these these or dreaming. Mm. Uh, yeah, like is, the karmapa dream yoga. You become enlightened through yeah. dream yoga. I heard. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I've been practicing dream yoga for quite a few years mm. and uh, it just came naturally to me. And I discovered it was just because 
I've been doing it in many previous lifetimes. Nice. And, uh, and so, um, it's something that I still do, uh, you know, but it's, it's, uh, quite a bit different now than it used to be, but, um, a little more indescribable now. Uh, uh, but, but, uh, more similar to my, uh, my near death experience actually, but, um, the, uh, well, depending, so I still have, I still have karmic dreams. If, you know, mm -hmm. if you're familiar with the difference between dreams of clarity and dreams of karmic, uh, dreams, you know, the karmic yeah. dreams are just kind of reflections of your daily life. Uh, dreams of clarity are more, uh, open and, uh, you're, you know, what's happening. They're more loose. They're lucid, insightful, insightful. You have, you have, uh, you know, more choices and uh, mm. you're not just sort of drifting through your dream. Right. <laughs> so karmic dreams are like a reflection of what happened yesterday or maybe when, when you were a child right. or something, you know, something related to karma. But, um, but I, I know uh, that if you do dream yoga, your spiritual practice is a thousand times better than just you know, even meditating all day long. Yeah. You know, just so much more potent because your heart and mind are much more open when you're dreaming. Uh, when you're going through daily life, uh, we tend to be a little more uptight. And I think that's maybe why it, it's such a long dream, you know, it just, we're just clinging to everything. Mm. And, uh, and so uh, spiritual practice is a little bit more difficult in our daily life i think would you say that it's because of the the ego mind is more active like the the conscious mind as it were is more dominant or in the in the foreground kind of thinks it's in control or it's scope awareness limited to that because you can see in dreams like you get in contact with the subconscious mind more the collective unconscious things like that more easy be a way of explaining it i i guess um i would I would tend to think that uh, our daily life, we think it's more real. Mm. Our, during a dream, we we accept things that don't. So make it's kind sense. of more playful because it's not necessarily real, and also yeah. you're not bound by the logic of thinking it's real or not. Perhaps. Yeah, yeah. you're not. Since it's a, a shorter dream, you're you're more Just inclined to it. let things go and accept things and not take it too seriously. It kind of short circuits mm -hmm. the logical mind. Because it yeah, doesn't like, really need to make sense of it as much, or something. No, yeah. it's like dream. I I call it dream logic. You know, it makes mm, sense in the yeah. dream, but then you right. wake up and it's like that didn't make any sense. Why did I think yeah. that made sense? You know, <laughs> so that gives you more freedom to explore and dig into those areas. Then, yeah, right, right, and to really, it's it's almost like you know, like immersion therapy or something. I always talk about, you know, you know how I am. I like to make broad, generalizing, sweeping statements. And for anyone that doesn't know my style <laughs> <laughs> and then you sit back and watch the reaction yeah exactly and then, <laughs> then spontaneously react to the the chaos that ensues but uh <laughs> you know so one of those broad generalizing yeah. statements i like to make is that yeah. all dreams and usually i in this case i would mean what you're calling karmic dreams you know mm -hmm. um that all dreams are either a desire a fear or a combination of the two and so it's like primarily we work out our the energy side of the desire or the fear so one example would be you know you 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 see a little baby spider and you get spooked and then you you have a dream that night that a 10 foot tall spider is biting you in half and then you wake yeah. up and you see a silver dollar size spider and like that's not that big not a big, no deal. big deal yeah, yeah. It's over whatever there, I don't silver care. dollar tarantula whatever <laughs> at least it's not 10 feet tall and biting me in half no right. that type right. of thing so you're you suddenly more equipped in there. You yeah you've right. like rewired the the energetic attachment yep. to that or something well, and, and i mean it's the the three poisons of uh ignorance attachment and aversion are mm. kind of overactive in a karmic dream and you see kind yeah. of a microcosm kind of, of that. caricaturized in a way yeah. yeah so you know you don't know what something is so that makes you frightened and then and then uh, then you, you discover what it is and you, you like it now you want it and then you realize it's not what you want so now you're or it's something other than what you want now you're afraid again and <laughs> it's just, yeah it's interesting it's that, that in a dream those things are more intense 
and that yeah. upon awakening they fall away and that we use the term awakening that is interesting yeah 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 it's just like with the seeking mind yeah. even though this is the same world it's like you know we talk about it as if waking up from a dream but really we wake up in the dream but right. we're just lucid right now <laughs> right <laughs> right now we're yeah. lucid in a dream yeah. yeah this what this conversation is happening in a big long dream yeah in reality it's not it's not real and you know and maybe maybe that's one of the reasons i wrote the frog in kind of a humorous way is because it, it feels like a big joke i mean it feels mm. like oh i got the cosmic joke i, I understand yeah. now and it's right. why was i so serious about everything before you know and it's like no yeah. it's not that big a deal <laughs> so some people call me joker in that sense yeah I, and I'm uh, sure. <laughs> it's like that you know the, the seriousness gets sucked out you know and uh yeah. like you said it's not like we're it's not like it's not serious enough it's it's the most serious topic that can be pondered or thought of or realized it's just that the nature of it is uh, the innate joy of being is so empty and free and untethered that it's not, it's more like a child at play than anything. I like in the Tao Te Ching, it says, whose child yeah. is this? You know? Yeah. Yep. That's, that's or Buddha nature itself. You excellent know? way of explaining it. You know, it's, you, you realize you can just have fun. You don't have, you can lighten yeah, exactly. up about everything. You can enjoy it. Yeah, it's, enjoy it. it's yeah. the enjoyment body, the bliss sheath. Lean yeah. into that. That's what I always tell people. I say, you know, mm -hmm. it's great that Eckhart Tolle is talking about the pain body and introducing people to the path of the, but you know, once you get further along the path of awakening and you approach the the ripe fruits of enlightenment, you lean more and more into the Sambhogakaya, into the enjoyment body, and yeah. more and more and more and more. You get more and more free, more and more enjoyment, more and more bliss more of the uh, energetic dimension becomes yeah, exactly. apparent and absolutely and, uh, subtle yeah. subtle reveals yep. itself yeah yep yeah it's beautiful it's, it's a it's a wonderful thing and you know uh it's something that uh most most people are not aware of that mm -hmm. and you know might be frightened by it even because they they don't know what that is but it's always here yeah it's always here it'll just like the dharmakaya is always here even though most people cannot see right. or fathom the dharmakaya um it's it's uh part of our nirmanakaya dimension this physical condition that we find ourselves in uh is is all part of the sambhogakaya and the dharmakaya at all times and so awakening uh you you open your heart and mind to that. Uh, maybe not fully at first. Maybe you know in stages. Right. A lot of right. a lot of the time, I I would say, I, you know, I guess I hadn't haven't thought about it a lot, but I I guess I I have this sense that there's uh, stages to awakening. That mm. you know, part of the discovery of emptiness is still, uh, an earlier phase of that. I don't know what he's barking. Yeah, Sasquatch out there. <laughs> <laughs> Bigfoot walk by the door. <laughs> no, I, I don't see anything. Bigfoot tall moose or something. <laughs> I it must have been a, a deer or something. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't see anything. <laughs> <laughs> At least saw something. <laughs> we get uh, we get a lot of uh, deer in our yard and occasionally. Timber wolves and I was gonna say I thought you said something about a wolf yeah. trotting through the other day. Yeah. Well, we had a pack of wolves killed a deer the other day, not too far from our house. Oh uh, boy. The uh, kind of two two uh, properties over from us. Wow. And uh, in fact, today uh, I was uh, taking bones away from the dogs because they were finding oh, parts yeah. that were left over. <laughs> oh wow. Poor poor deer, you know, but. Yeah. Uh, but that's nature, you know, that's, that's just how it is. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, you know, we had bears and all kinds of different foxes and that's cool. all kinds of animals here. A lot of like bald eagles and yeah, yeah, 
the deer hang out in our yard though a lot because they like to come and raid our bird feeders. So you feed them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I try not to feed, you know, leave too many seeds out there, but the hooligans come out of the forest and, yeah. and raid everything. <laughs> in Pennsylvania, we used to put out like honey flavored bird seed in this thing, and the black bears would come to bend the thing down. Oh, yeah. Steal the, steal the honey in it. <laughs> yep, that happens all the time here. Yeah. At least in the, in the warmer months. Right, but, uh, right. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's a pretty cold thing. here. It's funny when I tell people, uh, people from other countries, well, oh, it's the weather like in Iowa where you go, oh, oh, in the winter it gets to negative 20 Fahrenheit. In the summer it's 110. Yeah. And they're like, yeah. what? <laughs> it's quite a range. <laughs> I, uh, I used to live down near Iowa, southern Minnesota for a few years and oh, I couldn't, couldn't handle the summers. <laughs> they were so yeah. hot. Yeah. What's it like where you're at with the summers? Is it not quite um, as bad? How it's, what's the know, highest it gets? Like in like 90 degrees is about the warmest it gets. Yeah. Uh, people start complaining once it hits 70, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I don't mind the cold, like, uh, the heat on the other hand. Yeah, you can always add yeah. layers, but the heat yeah. can't rip your yeah. skin off, you know. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's not like, uh, not like the, uh, not like the corn belt at all, so. So yeah, we we're uh, northern Minnesota is generally cool, uh, kind of where I'm at near Lake Superior. Is you say you're up by the border, cool. aren't you? Yep, not too far from Canada. Yep. So. Yep. Well, so, I've, yeah, I, I, one thing I wanted to. Oh, go ahead, sorry. Forest in the background there. Oh yeah. Big trees through that window. Nice. Mm -hmm. yeah, you got a beautiful property there, and. Uh, a lot yeah. of the pictures you take are just, just mind blowing, you know. It's great. Thank you. you know? <laughs> I'm I'm using one of them on my YouTube channel on that is the banner. It's one of the pictures you took yep. just for everyone out there to to know that he's uh got some really good photographs, man. Anywhere where it's cold too, it's it's very uh, Tibetan vibe, you know, because it's yes. it's so cold that you get the sun dogs in the sky, just like in you yeah. to in the Himalayas or something, and the uh, Got a very Himalayan vibe where you're at because of that from my perspective. I like that. Yep. It's cool. Yeah. Well, it's it's really conducive to spiritual practice. I mean, I uh, as you know, I like to go sit outside uh all year round. I sit sit on the lake shore and you know, it was almost 30 below here uh last wow. night and uh you know, 33 below centigrade, I guess I saw. And uh and um it was uh you know, this afternoon it was all sunny and I, I thought, perfect. I'm going to, and I went and sat, you know, in the sunshine down by the lake and <laughs> it was great. <laughs> it's just, I just love it. You know, and I, as a Zogchen practitioner too, you know, having that bright sky is always, you know, really nice. You know, I try not to, I squint, you know, I try not to, you know, try not to look at it too much, but uh, having that bright out in front right. is safe so conducive to to uh Dzogchen practice you know it's definitely so, something about that i've noticed you know when it's really sunny out especially if you have like the snow reflecting it there's yeah. just something just borderline magical about it kind of like a yeah well you just you touch yeah. with drala or something there's like something very elemental about it you know yeah well you just uh you know you just rest into that and the bright light reminds a person of dharmakaya and you know you just relax just and i've been seeing it everywhere it's like one of those synchronicity things like when your mind is primed to be looking for it you see things everywhere yeah. i've been seeing little references of dharmakaya everywhere and every little song that's played it is like uh -huh. it's everywhere it's just yeah. freaking everywhere because at first when you when you first think about it it's like okay it's a pretty rare thing not a yeah. lot of people have access to this and it's only in really extreme situations they would and this is like the crowning jewel of uh, the awakened experience on a certain band and yet once you kind of are in that it's uh i'm just seeing it everywhere i'm seeing like mm -hmm. pop culture references to the Dermakaya everywhere yeah. you know? it's like oh wow it's like like you were saying it's always right here it's just well, what's, well why what's wouldn't it be you know, it, you know? Yeah. Your, your daily life is is like a big long dream so your spiritual practice should be in synchronization with that big long dream. You should be seeing yeah. things that are related to what your uh, spiritual practice is. Right, right. You know, all about what's happening at the moment. You know, that's 
And you see this that, in every tradition happened. too, though. The Dharma Kai mm-hmm. reference, you know, the sun behind the sun. Uh huh. Every tradition they talk about, you know, is it bright like a, a million suns? It's the yeah. only point of reference they have for something that bright is yeah. the sun itself, you know. And they talk about the sun being, you know, nothing. That's like a, a shadow compared to what they saw. Yes. Know? Yes. Well, that's uh, that's what I see in these different forums with uh, people who've had near death experiences everybody's talking about the source or the this bright bright amazing light that yeah. you can't really even describe it's so bright and you know it's uh you know we say bright light but you know then the person almost always says but you can't really explain what that is that you just yeah. you know you use the term bright light but it's not really bright light it's something right it's, it's something that's More not a thing that. it's, yeah, beyond, it's not limited to that yeah yeah it's not our it's not an object it's not something you can actually describe right and so to understand that you have to awaken you know it's just that simple so you know people will say well why should i awaken and you know maybe a better question is why not <laughs> I mean, right? You know, ask yourself that. People always ask me that. They say, "Well, do I need this?" I say, "Well, no. You can keep suffering. You can keep suffering. Yeah." I will. Why would I want this? Well, do you want suffering to end or not? No. Next time, yeah. next time you're complaining about something or other, then uh, you know, ask yourself if you need to awaken. Then you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, we have this great opportunity to awaken. I mean, the human life is that's what it's cut out for is awakening and people tend to squander it because they don't they don't really want to realize what that is yeah. to awaken and you, you can't know? make them thirsty for it you can't make them hungry for it it's uh oh. it's kind of like elon musk said about being your own boss he said if you need a motivational talk to do this then don't do it right. <laughs> in other words if you need me to convince you to want enlightenment then don't even worry about it because right. if it's not every fiber of your being that you you fucking need this immediately. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I always say that uh, bodhicitta is the key to awakening. Yeah. So bodhicitta is love and compassion with the desire to awaken. Totally. That's and, short, and short explanation of what. That yeah, is. absolutely. You know, and I always talk about that. People say, well, you know. Buddhism says don't desire. That's not what it says. That's mistranslated. It says to triage and prioritize your desires so that you're desiring what will actually satisfy you, which is awakening. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, if you treat Buddhism as a thou shalt not series of instructions. <laughs> Instead of loose guidelines. You'll, you'll yeah. never awaken if, you, if the way, that's how you The way you I put it. that is I say a good Buddhist is a bad Buddhist and a bad Buddhist is a good Buddhist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In other words, a, a good Buddhist knows that this is just a loose series of guidelines for yeah. an exact science of phenomenology. <laughs> it's Buddhism is only a path that must be abandoned at some point. Yeah, yeah. And people, you know, people get shocked by that statement. It's kind of a provocative statement. We mean by but, kill the Buddha, yeah. But but if you don't abandon the path, uh, when you're ready to abandon it, you, you know, you won't awaken because right. awakening is it's is like not that. the path. The path itself is just it's just a series of practices that Train that meals. help you to understand uh, more and more clearly why you should awaken. And as you venture down that path, your, your desire to awaken becomes greater and greater. Right. Because, uh, because now you're really looking at what's happening. You're seeing your life. You're seeing the world around you. Um, then you start to understand ultimate bodhicitta, which is what that supreme light, the supreme source really is, is ultimate bodhicitta. And it can't be defined. It's not really something you can really define. And and so you, you know, the 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 step of awakening is opening your heart and mind to that. So from different finally spiritual, having direct access to it and then yeah. using that direct access that you finally have to right. further it. Right. Um, so from different spiritual traditions or religious traditions, you even, you know, you can say that. Um, you know, I, I've done some talks in, uh, at, in a church here, a couple talks. I've been invited back a couple of times. And uh, 
I this last one, I it was about how bodhicitta is the key to everything. And I explained, uh, and there's a number of Christians in that in that group, uh, and I explained how you know Christ, his only teaching was really love and compassion. Yeah, which is very actually. He was actually teaching Buddhism. Yeah, he's a Dharma <laughs> you know? practitioner. Exactly. But, exactly. But right. Let's, you know, that's a controversial statement, but we might know, be quiet about that in certain contexts, but some, it seems some, to be obviously the case. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some people are, are not comfortable with that. But, you know, even if you're, you know, if you're, uh, you know, and if, even if it's something that, uh, you know, maybe you don't want to accept, uh, the truth of the matter is if you look at Christ's teachings, it's all about love and compassion. And what was that thing that he said? The kingdom of God is within yeah. you. Yeah. Well, right. that's awakening. You're looking yeah. within, and there's, you know, you look within, there's Dharmakaya. And he was that's... manifesting all these Tibetan cities, you know, all these supernatural <laughs> yeah. powers you only hear about in Nepal and Tibet. And he was <laughs> demonstrating them. It's like so obvious. Yeah. 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 That's <laughs> oh, right. where did he go so... from 12 to 30? Oh, gee whiz. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I had, a, I had an argument with a theologian when I was in college because uh, I went to a Jesuit university and I was this hyper Buddhist oh. guy arguing with Jesuits, you know, about oh. the logic of Catholicism versus Buddhism type of thing. Right. I said, you know, I said, from my perspective, it's pretty obvious that Jesus went to, you know, India and D Tibet and Nepal throughout that whole area when he was about, you know, from like 12 to 30. Mm -hmm. And they said, oh, that's preposterous, you know. Oh, I used to believe that. Then we realized better. And they go on and on and on trying to debunk it. And then uh, like an hour later, I had shifted the conversation to something totally different as a trick. And I said, so isn't it true that uh, Jesus's disciples went, hopped a ride on the spice caravan to India and uh, they, you know, like a, like a highway to India. And then they preached uh, uh, Christianity throughout the East. They were, oh yeah, absolutely. We have plenty of it. I said, aha, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell me that wasn't around a few decades before that. Gotcha. Right. <laughs> No, like, there's, oh no. <laughs> no, there's there's another way of looking at it too is that there are texts in india that have to do with christ <laughs> yeah exactly exactly so, yeah so that side. we're not influenced by people right. from from the middle east or europe Beautiful. so yeah. yeah but uh yeah that's a big long discussion <laughs> this is a i'm going on a metaphysical whim here this could be total bullshit what i'm about to say real quick then we can loop back around but you know i was thinking about the i was researching the shroud of turin you know and who knows it could be anything right you know it could be debunked or could, but i thought it was an interesting take on it that someone was talking about was kind of like from the sok chen perspective of you know kind of like becoming a ball of light or whatever but that's mm -hmm. really what the story was indicating happened to jesus in a way it was a very tibetan rainbow body type ending and yeah. uh what if, you know, maybe, maybe that's, yeah, who knows, you know, who knows? <laughs> well, yeah, that, that occurred to me as well. It's, uh, it's some amazing parallels there. <laughs> so seems like more, more than a coincidence. Yeah. That was one thing I talked about in my book is that uh, I believe that uh, uh, Yeshua, uh, you know, that's the, that was what his name actually was, should actually be part of the Buddhist lexicon. Absolutely. Just like in uh, one of the communities we're involved in with Pamako Buddhism, we have, uh, yeah, we, we kind yeah. of talk about that quite a bit, like, uh, you know, the importance of like, you know, Jesus, Babaji and Buddha or whatever, you know, it's like, why yeah. not? Why not yeah. use Guru, Guru Yoga to kind of tap into the, the energetic yeah. signatures of, of Jesus? Why not? As a why Dharma practitioner, why wouldn't why you? Not? He's a Dharma master. Why wouldn't you tap into that? Well, yeah. why why not? I've actually been to uh, Buddhist retreats where the the uh, teacher was saying, you know, we're practicing guru yoga, and the teacher was saying, even if you know, if your if your guru is Jesus, you should that's who you should visualize, and then you and Jesus become one. Yeah. Why not? Why not? Yeah. You, you, you get into that space, download that particular flavor. Why wouldn't you? It's exactly. just a, its own type of empowerment. You know, you don't have to limit yourself yeah. to anyone. It's like when we receive Buddhist tantric Vajrayana empowerments. It's like it's not just one signature you're tapping into. It's usually dozens, you know. Oh, yeah, definitely. You get all those different um, and it's intense. It's uh, at this point, you know, 
it's not you know what, what used to be referred to as subtle isn't very subtle anymore you know that's why we're mm -hmm. leaning into the subtle subtle because you can you know and uh yeah. it's, it's just so intense. interesting the energy is just so obvious now yeah oh definitely definitely yeah it's um you know i, I there's there's no reason to limit ourselves uh Ever. to say okay i'm this is what you know this is the specific uh and that's you know something i wrote about too is you know don't don't just say you have to be one thing and then follow a strict set of rules yeah do what's exactly. right for you you know it resonates your... moment to moment that can shift around that's one of the methods for awakening i give yep. people because that's usually yeah. what they're asking for you know and you, yeah. you don't expect a not always figure to give methods but there are some and one of those yeah. is just to resonate with whatever resonates hop around the moment it stops resonating shift gears the moment it starts resonating again go back to it why would you force anything contrive anything unnaturally tell a story that doesn't feel right or natural you know yep. just follow that gut instinct level and uh that alone is a almost like a superpower to, to be able to yes. detect where that resonance is because that, that'll effortlessly guide the seeking you know well, well that gut instinct is our buddha nature mm. And if you're really paying attention to it, and, and that's not to be confused with wishful thinking, but really paying attention to this intuition, intuitive part of ourselves, this Buddha nature, you start realizing that, oh, it never steers me wrong. Right. Never. I'm, it's you always, it. yeah, I'm always going in the right direction when I listen to that. Yeah. And you can test it and say, well, I'm going to. I'm not going to listen to it. I'm going to go do something else. I'm going to veer it off. It starts to fall apart. Yeah. And it's this tragedy. I know. <laughs> like, but it's when the ego wow, mind says, I know better. Yeah. yeah. And, and then, then it goes up. Oh, shouldn't have done that. Itself. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I should have listened to. Uh, yeah. It's almost like, uh, you know, if we were talking, if I was talking to a Christian, I might say something like, you know, that's the, that's the voice of God urging you to do this or that you know and and your mm -hmm. own little ego mind thinks it knows better <laughs> you know it's yeah. like the That's conscious mind oh i'm gonna go against what i'm feeling uh, yeah directly being uh inspired to do divinely instead of or list or listening to the awareness the buddha nature however you want to call it you know but when you go against that it's always the ego mind thinking it knows better than the intuitive drive and then things in trouble never work out every that time well. yeah. yeah i mean it's a sinking I, feeling everything falls apart yeah yep i think it's uh i think it's safe to say that god is synonymous with dharmakaya which is synonymous with buddha nature yep i know that's that would be that's a controversial thing the to void say right there. awareness god buddha nature yeah. shiva and and you know i i i I agree. You no, know, I would say uh, I, I'm not saying God, the theistic, not a personal, theory, not a entity, not, not yeah. some guy sitting on a throne, but God, the all pervasive, beyond uh, the theistic manifestation, yeah. beyond what you can beyond our concepts of it. Yeah. Yes. So that that would be the same as Buddha nature or dharmakaya or the source i i would say all of those things uh it, you know if you're looking at it totally. that way i would say it's the same yeah so so then i would say okay you you don't have to abandon whatever it is you're you're doing yeah. as long as you develop the tools and the skills to be able to uh open yourself up to that that uh infinite wisdom because it's everywhere it's in every tradition it's everywhere it's find not, an access point from whatever yeah. tradition you're in or there's beyond no, all tradition there's no religion that or no philosophy that has a monopoly on that that yeah. is equally available to everybody and it's so beyond our conceptualizations of it that mm -hmm. of course it's not captured in any one of our our human systems how could it be it's right. so infinitely vastly expansively spacious how could yep. we put it in a box and go okay got it captured it yeah yeah <laughs> that's kind of what a lot of religions do they they tell you that they have the only answer and it's like yeah uh -uh. <laughs> time out <laughs> it's funny because sometimes i'll see a quote by jesus or something and i'll go oh i see what he meant like i'm saying the same thing 
This is yeah. they really hyped up his what he was doing. He says, you know, I am the light. If you follow me, you won't walk in darkness. And I'm, well, I'm yes. saying the same thing. It's just very down to earth. You know, it's not this yep. hyped up. It's not like he's the only access point. He's just yeah. happened to be a sage that, that was indeed a living direct interface to clarity. Well, right. people have access to that too with us or <laughs> anyone else. We have plenty of people that are in this state. This isn't uh, mm -hmm. the mind likes to think that awakening is so rare because then then it has an excuse not to awaken and to keep suffering. <laughs> well, it's, I mean, we there are countless Buddhas. Awakening is not as uncommon as people want to say. Um, you know, Buddha Shakyamuni is not the only awakened being, um, you know, countless beings have awakened since then, and countless beings have awake, awakened before him, there were Buddhas before him, you know, 16, 18,000 years ago, there was uh, Shenrab, Tompa Shenrab, the, the Buddha of the Bon religion, mm, Yeah, that was a Buddha. And guess what? That Buddha said uh, basically that bodhicitta is the key to everything. Yeah, that's weird. All these sages are saying <laughs> the same a, exact ooh, thing over the course. They're saying the same thing. Ends yes. of millennia. Gee whiz! I wonder right. why that is. Well, I've I've had people uh, <laughs> argue with me about that point about bodhicitta, and they love arguing. They've that said one. they've said, well, no, it's renunciation has to happen before bodhicitta. <laughs> and I say, I come back and I say, well, why would you renounce? Why would you renounce if you didn't have bodhicitta? Unnatural. Why would you pretend? You're, basically, you're just, is what they're saying. You're just yeah. going to renounce. You, it has nothing to do with it's having love and compassion. Yeah. You're, you're, you don't have a desire to awaken. You don't have love and compassion for yourself. You just decided one day, I'm going to renounce. <laughs> that doesn't happen. It's a cool story. Yeah, exactly. The, the way I put it, as I say, everyone, all, all these seekers are trying to like, they're like, oh, Andrew, you must have been cultivated and disciplined and like no like attachment doesn't just gradually fall away as you practice it, it it really falls away in a huge chunk upon awakening yeah and then the remaining 10 percent or whatever after awakening kind of gets ironed out over time if it needs to and i need to who cares but yeah. that 90 percent gone Boom. instantly <laughs> yeah. yeah so the way i put it and again i make bold generalizing statements i'll use that as a disclaimer but Furthermore, you know, yeah, attachment falls away upon awakening, not until then. And how do you get to awakening? Yeah, you want to have to want it. <laughs> you have to want it, yes. And, <laughs> um, and why would anybody want that if not for, you know, compassion for the sake for of yourself. liberation? And yeah, so that for same others. compassion you have for yourself, that same desire to want to be free. And so people always ask me, well, why are you doing these talks? It's like, well, I want my enlightenment over there. You know, it's like obviously it's because of selfish and this is enjoyable, but yeah, I want this to spread. I want this to expand. That's what it does. It's not even me wanting. This is just what it does. Yeah. It's Why are you doing that? Bit, Clarity clarifies it. Expansion it's, expands. It's incredible. I'm, it's incredibly hard to keep this to yourself. Yeah. You know, once you realize <laughs> that that this is something everybody can attain and it's so amazingly incredible yeah you know why would you keep it to yourself right you know, people always say why like, are you talking about this you know about it they say my sage friends don't talk about it. i said well lao tzu couldn't shut up about it jesus couldn't shut up. the buddha had a crowd of people gathering for him to speak about it why is that yeah, why did Tom they kill Samla, socrates for, they murdered <laughs> socrates on. for running his mouth about it you yeah. know they murdered yeah. jesus for running his mouth about it yeah yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it, it's because uh, to develop awareness, we have to have great compassion. Well, okay, you have great compassion, but you don't have enough compassion to, to help yeah. somebody awaken. But you don't have the skillfulness. You no, know? yeah. <laughs> or this, you haven't developed the skillfulness or whatever. Yeah, like, you know I mean, like good, good intention you have is to. impotent without the charge, you know, so you got to have the skillfulness, you got to have the the desire, the bodhicitta, you got to transmute the anger into precision. Yeah. And yeah. really, you have to lean into bliss somehow. And yeah. in my my experience, all of the most intense experiences I've had, uh, in other words, the big three I can think of being, you know, spontaneous kundalini awakening, full blast, beyond the crown into an astral samadhi, 
arriving to the gates of Dharmakaya, but no further and, and conversing mm -hmm. with the different forms of light. That was at age 24. And then three years later, this geometric shape of light I saw, this energetic signature, if you will. And then five months after that, liberation itself with the flavorings of the kind of the non-dual honeymoon, but also this kind of sorcery vibe overlaying even that. And all three of those experiences, I can almost directly trace to being triggered by bliss itself mm -hmm. somehow in one form yeah. or another the yeah. just spontaneous falling into bliss it very obviously seemed to trigger all these experiences or be so intimately tied to them that uh mm -hmm. inseparable you know mm -hmm. yeah well i i would i would have to uh, i totally understand that i mean just it just uh the sense of bliss, the sense of nirvana. Um, one of the hardest things for me to learn was to let go of nirvana, you know, this, yeah. this bliss, because if we cling to nirvana, that can become an obstacle also. You know, that was, uh, that was actually a, a teaching by Milarepa. Mm. And uh, I, I wasn't favorites. sure I understood that when I first read it, but I understand it now, you know. It's, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, it, his disciples were all clinging to nirvana. Mm. And so uh, sometimes the, the word nirvana can mean different things. You know, it can mean uh, bliss or it can mean awakening or it can make, mean full awakening, you know. So, I mean, I, I think that the, the way Milarepa was explaining it was, um, more of the understanding of, you know, nirvana and samsara are just two sides of the same coin, you know, right. that, that kind of understanding of that's nirvana. how I use the word. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's like another, another trap, just like it, uh, being an intellectual is a trap, you know, yeah. that, or that's, that's one possibility or like it would, into... it would shut you off from the exploration or enjoyment of the ignorance of the delusion of the dream. In other words, mm -hmm. part of the enjoyment of the dream is that on a subtle level for a moment, we can forget that there's, in other words, the fact that there seems to be two of us here right now on some level, even though we're both in this state, is quite enjoyable. Yes. And also, I can see how it directly ties into your story. Uh, if you're looking at Nirvana as an even more ultimate form, because you came back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so obviously, yeah. you weren't too attached to the ultimate bliss, because here we are. <laughs> it was so hard to come back, though. Yeah, I, <laughs> I was, I was, as I was starting yeah. to remember my life. I was thinking, oh, this will be so painful. <laughs> oh, but it was, it was really great compassion that brought me That's back heroic right there it was right? like no. i have to do this because of you know beings are suffering right. i have to do what i can do you know i can't do everything but i can certainly make an effort and uh and uh become very devoted to this notion of of having helped everybody to awaken you know yeah. so that's 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 what brought me back was this, this, it was bodhicitta that brought, brought me back because if it would have been purely a selfish motivation, I wouldn't have wanted to stay. There. I wouldn't have wanted to come back. I would have wanted to stay there. Right. And it's not necessarily um, a choice. But I wouldn't it's have just, had the choice either. It's if what I would you are. Selfish. You know, it's like <laughs> when, you, when you're so bathed in the depth of the true self, yeah. you're bound by your own perfect nature. In other words, you have no yeah. choice but to be infinitely loving. So yeah. you didn't have... So in that sense, you know, even if you look at this, because there's three different layers we could look at this from, you know, on the most fundamental, um, on the grossest level, we could say there seem to be separate beings here in physical yeah. forms. And then on a higher level, you could say, well, there's kind of something in between that and the ultimate where there's these energetic forms, these, these right. astral multidimensional shapes of light that are less mm -hmm. bound. Each one of them is like a living God. And yet ultimately... Mm -hmm. And so in that layer, you could like, so on the fundamental gross layer, you would say, I have the great desire for all beings to be free on the mm -hmm. astral layer. You might say something like, oh, all beings are free. And then on the, the ultimate layer, they don't know it. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. But down yeah. here, they don't feel it that way. But then ultimately, there are no beings. However, just because there are no beings, this is a you're still bound by the nature of your loving physics. You're still infinitely loving, even to the figments of your imagination, as if as if they matter, as if they're real, as if yeah. it's serious. Yep. Even knowing all the while the ultimate nature, it still doesn't detract from the spontaneous, unconditional compassion for apparent beings. Right, right. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, um, you know, without falling into the trap of nihilism, you know, we, we've got to be very careful uh, about that because, you know, certainly there are, there is this appearance of beings. There are beings who are suffering the, you know, as maybe sure it's a figment of their own imagination, but they don't know that. Right. And so, so it's this, this ultimate bodhicitta, this great compassion for this aspect of us in this dull portion of a dull universe uh, where beings are wandering and confused and asleep. And, and you know, so the, uh, they don't know that, that they're actually this amazing light that they actually have complete and total awareness. They don't know that. And so when, when you see it that way, you, it's hard to have concern for yourself. You have concern for these beings because if you've already tasted the Dharmakaya, then there's no problem for, you, for yeah, yourself. Right, because right. You know you're already, you're imagining self. Right on this non-conceptual like when people ask me level. how i am i always hesitate i'm like hi how are you i'm just like i'm always that's okay what i do you know i don't want to sound <laughs> cocky like oh i'm always okay how are you and that's what i but do that's that's i i always i either hesitate and just go with it eh, i'm fine but it's like yeah. i'm always okay you know you go, to, go to the doctor's office and on a scale of one to ten where's your pain level today i'm like um Oh, let me think. Uh, I, three, I guess. <laughs> not pain. even not even paying attention to the pain. You know? Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just just what is socially how are, how are acceptable feeling? as a response. Well, yeah. I, I guess if I was normal, I'd I'd be uh, having trouble. But I, I'm not <laughs> it's, normal. It's so so don't much worry more about bearable. It. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it's exactly. not a problem. <laughs> yeah. It's so easily managed and bearable now. <laughs> that why even talk about it yeah exactly right right it doesn't yeah. doesn't really matter <laughs> you know, like, exactly yeah uh yeah so it's um the, yeah this isn't where the I mean, fire is it's the you know yeah, put out the fire I mean, it's there's more extreme forms of suffering the yeah it just happens it's just spontaneous that's what's so funny when you hear about like uh the arhat versus the bodhisattva it's like well those are just modes the awakened mind goes into you can weave in and out of that within a given day in the awakened mm -hmm. state. Yeah. Well, these it's are happened, and we can't take credit for either one. Bodhisattvas and arats who are imagining themselves yeah. <laughs> in the human form. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, you know, a bodhisattva is people people attribute uh, sort of these supernatural abilities, but mm. you know, the, the moment somebody takes the bodhisattva vow, they're a bodhisattva. Yeah. You know, you're on the first boomy. It's right. not too hard to be on the first boomy. Right. You know, now you're devoted to helping all beings. And then you cultivate that through the 10 boomies, you know. Well, you know, that's that doesn't mean you've become a fully enlightened Buddha yet. It just means that you're you're developing and cultivating bodhicitta. Yeah. Which is absolutely correct. It's you know we're getting that, rid of layers of selfing, we're getting rid of gross people. selfing, then getting rid of subtle mm -hmm. selfing, then getting rid of subtle, subtle selfing. But yeah. the funny thing to me is when people make a, a big fuss about the distinction uh, between a newly awakened baby sage, as it were, and a fully enlightened living Buddha, because from my humble perspective, the difference is 10%, right? It's like the, the machinations of the energy body, 90% falls yeah. away upon awakening. Yep. And some of yeah. us might be gifted enough to talk about it more lucidly than others, whatever, but yeah. they're in the same state. But then that last 10%, once that last 10% falls away, then you might say, oh, I, this is a living Buddha, 100% clear energy system. There's no it, shred of that, but it's 10% difference. <laughs> it's not a linear progression. 
you know, it's not, it's not linear. It's, yeah. it's more like this, you know, it's more yeah. like, it's more like, you know, you, you, you're going through your day and all of a sudden everything's bright light right. for just a second. And then you grab that because you had that lucid moment of awakening. And then now you you're clinging to it and it's gone. And it's like, well, where did it go? I, I just had it. And I don't, I can't even remember what that was, you know? So, you know, you went up to, you know, you went on this cyclical thing where you, you you're yeah. almost ready to awaken and then you, you ruined it because you grabbed a hold of it. You, yeah, Cause you reached out thing. and tried to grab yeah. it and put it in your pocket. Yeah, exactly. Mine. Mine, mine, mine this thing nope, here gone. Oh, yeah. there's no nothing <laughs> there what? chasing rainbows yeah exactly <laughs> pawing yeah. at the mirror images yeah. yeah so like when we're first born we're very close to the dharmakaya we, yeah. we just pass through that it's just like when adi da talks about right i don't know if you're familiar with adi da he's kind of a weird one but he he talks about his earliest memory being the bright yeah every time we die <laughs> that's we pass through awareness of of the dharmakaya but then but then because we hadn't awakened in our past life we we transmigrate into a new life and then we can't remember that because each new life we have uh new problems new concerns you know you got a new it's language a you gotta theme. learn yeah. a new culture different you content learn. similar theme structure yeah. Yeah. different relatives different right. friends you know <laughs> it's yeah, like everything's point. different yeah. and right. and so you forget what that was very relatively quickly right. but uh, you know there's a lot of uh, case studies where uh young children can talk about their past life right. in detail and you know like children three four years old and then as they get older they can't remember that anymore and sometimes they'll even meet their old family and they'll be more yeah. attached to their old yeah. family than their current one yeah, in, in a few situations, yeah. they, they certainly encounter that sort of thing. So, yeah, that's uh, that's an interesting very... an interesting case study on, on attachment in general and on forgetting and kind of like what we were saying, where when you remember the the old energetic attachments kind of come in. Well, now you remember all your connections to your your old family, and now you're looking at your current mom, going, "You're not you're not my mom. That's yeah. my mom." The old right. lifetime mom. That's my real mom. You get all so confused. You, you can see the weird, yeah. You can kind of see yeah. why we forget on a certain yeah. level. It's like yep. people ask me all the time. And so, you know, you've had all these really intense, mind-blowing advances. So clearly you must have some memory of I don't have any memory of any of my no, yeah. I don't. Yeah. And uh you know, on a you certain level, I feel wanted. like I probably could, yeah. If I you, and I might one day, I wanted. might do that, like hypnosis and things like that, or deep meditative states. Um Mm -hmm. But, you know, on another level, part of my message is, has always been, you know, sometimes it's more important to forget. It depends, you know, it all depends. As, uh, past memories of past lives are not essential to, to awakening. It's not something They're that cool, will, but, it, it's yeah. kind of cool, you know, yeah. it's kind of fun. It's, uh, it can, it can be, be insightful too. Cause I've, I've, yeah, I've seen people like, uh, there's this one show I forget what it's called on YouTube. They did a bunch of these where they had this really advanced researcher from Canada, and he would he would find people's past lives, and he would find like verifiable evidence in the records of these people's mm -hmm. names where they lived, and people would be having recurring dreams from those times, and yeah. they'd be having recurring problems and recurring patterns in their life that they don't fully understand where they come from, mm -hmm. and then they realize that pattern came from something that happened to you in your past life. And then once yeah. they know that, suddenly that pattern is no longer a problem because they yeah. now they know why that was the issue. They know it doesn't have yes. anything to do with this life. Yep. And so well, then that, they can let it go. So sometimes it can be beneficial to let go of that attachment by remembering too. That was, I think, part of why I started to look at my past lives was because uh, when I was a young child, I had these recurring dreams of uh, basically fire, smoke, being crushed and then released into the air in plumes of smoke and fire but, you know i remembered that and i i dreamt that like every night for years and uh as i got older it was only when i was sick 
like if I had a cold or flu or something or fever type thing yeah. yeah then I would dream that but uh but I remember dreaming that very frequently when I was when I was a, a small kid and I, I I started to wonder well why why what was that all about and so then I discovered what that was and uh realized that I'd uh, I'd been hit by a bomb and exploded wow. and so you know when you're when you've been hit by a, you know, when you've been blown up, I mean, you're, you, you're trying to put your body back together, but there's no way to do it because you're just, you're just fire and ash, you know, you're just, you've been pulverized. And, uh, and so I remembered that sensation of trying to because put my body so back fast. together. Because it's so fast. Yes. Yeah, and I violent. Mean. I mean, you're just schmucked, you know, you mm. are poof. Wow. And very violent. And I, I recalled that. I recalled that death. Wow. You know, I, I was in, uh, I was living in, I'm, I'm assuming it was Tibet. And I was, uh, you know, my family, we were, we were nomadic and we were trying to get away from the, the army that was coming up this valley. And the army did what armies do. They, they clear the way and we were, mm-hmm. we were in the way. We couldn't get out fast enough. And so they, you know, they, they, uh, I got hit. I, I, I did see someone, uh, from Tibet that I think I'm, I'm pretty sure that was my sister who survived. Uh, but I don't want to contact her because, um, I don't want to cause any problems with her, right, right. you know, cause that does cause confusion. It and stirs it up and it yeah. stirs it up and, and, and I didn't, I didn't want to do that, you know, so, um, yeah. So I haven't told anybody who that was, but I, I, uh, I did see wow. that one relative and, uh, but, um, you know, for the most part, I, I think I was probably only, I don't know, six or seven when I died and, and, um, I wasn't very old, you know, I was supposed to go to a monastery and my family was happy about that. And I never got to go, of course, because I got I got uh, pulverized. There were political things going on in our region, mm, so yeah, couldn't, couldn't make it there. But um, you know, so I found that to be important, uh, just from you know analyzing my own what's what's happening with my spiritual path, and you know, I kind of had a bad attitude about things for a lot of years. <laughs> I didn't understand why, <laughs> even though. <laughs> I, I used to meditate when I was like three years old and, and, uh, oh, and yeah. uh, monkey and mind. I remember now monkey yeah, mind. Yeah. And I, I got mad at my mom for saying I had an imaginary friend called monkey. Monkey mind. Just like in our last talk, we talked about that. Cause then my next comment, just like in our last talk was when I was a little boy, I had a, uh, my imaginary friend was named Monkey. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> it was a big stuffed monkey. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's awesome. <laughs> and I'd carry it around. It was like, it was like my best friend. I was an only child, you know. Yeah. But it's also yeah. like, you know, like the human being is kind of an evolved ape, you know. It's kind of like the cosmic yeah. interfacing with itself. Exactly. That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's cool. You you knew the phrase yeah. monkey mind at three, and your parents didn't, and they didn't know what that meant. And then later on, they realized it, they were, it's a Buddhist you know, concept for the ego mind. Mid, yeah. Midwestern people <laughs> right, uh, right. grew up as Lutherans, and uh, yeah. you know, most most of the people we knew were Scandinavian. It's like, <laughs> <you Yeah. know, laughs> what would you know about monkey mind? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Where where would you have found that? Where would you like have found you, that? It's like you had uh, Google in your pocket back then, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You take your three-year-old self down to the library and, oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, I, knew what, I knew what that was. So, I mean, so it, was a, yeah. it was a memory that uh, translated. and That's how I uh, was with Buddhism. You know, it always resonated on an energetic level. Like, I was, yeah. I skipped around and did comparative religion stuff. You know, they all touch on it. Every religion kind of yeah. touches on it. But Buddhism, it's not perfect, but it comes closer than... Yeah. many of the other systems for this type of thing yeah. yeah i think because of the tragedy that happened uh in tibet uh in the late 50s i think there's a lot of people in the united states who have reincarnated or re- been too. reborn in the united states and canada this part of the world mm-hmm. from tibet totally. because you see a lot of people who are just like oh i know what buddhism is well how would you know that you didn't you you've never been uh, exposed to it i don't know i just yeah. seem to know I mean, it was even weirder for me because i 
for me, I was doing comparative world religion, but I hadn't yet discovered Buddhism. And yeah. I was like, okay, these all came close, but didn't really nail it down. I'm going to be the one to put this into a system, put it into words and really nail this yeah. down for everybody. Yeah. And I got about halfway through all the bullet points and I found Buddhism. I thought, oh, fuck, they already did it. <laughs> oh, this is one that's already out there. They already did. What I was, oh, cool. Yeah. And, well, you know. <laughs> that's what I always wanted Christianity to be. I was always yeah. trying to pound I... Christianity, you know, <laughs> to this, you know, square peg in a round hole. I just... Yeah. <laughs> it just didn't fit but it you know it's like it's like to me that's what resonated about christianity was the the buddhist aspects of it yeah, to the, me it was the like, actual message of the actual yeah. jesus i mean i had this attitude with my pastor that i he got would get mad at me for questioning things said so that's a lack of faith i said how could that be a, a lack of faith that's how you yeah, discover trying to the strengthen truth. my faith by I'm trying to strengthen my, my faith answer. that's why yeah. i'm questioning everything i want the confidence yeah and so yeah I mean, old old school uh, <laughs> but know, all they have oh, their dusty books you know, this little not... kid talking to me like this that's the thing <laughs> about it the priest isn't up there talking about his mind-blowing mystical experience he's up there talking from a dusty old book blah 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 Here's what's been said. Uh, hope I get my pension. I heard they're doing cutbacks. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. Got his coffee and his wine ready backstage. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Going through the motions. That's what's the problem with most religions. Is the empty motion. rituals. Just empty, especially in certain yep. pockets of Buddhism. You can see how there's just these people yeah. are just up there bored, going through empty rituals. Like this isn't this. There's no charge here. This isn't what this is for. This is right. just to go through waving your hands and wearing a certain colored uh, piece of cloth. Like, what are you doing? Right. Well, yeah. that's that's All where... the gatekeeping uh, and the traditional bullshit. And if you want the highest secret, you have to already be Chinese or whatever it is, you know? <laughs> <laughs> or whatever. Like, oh, isn't that on to this lineage yeah. or that lineage? Yeah. Or... yeah. Yeah. It's and only I, the I mean, we'll only accept three disciples, and only the top disciple will get all the answers. It's like, come on. That's where Buddhism gets in trouble. You know, it's it's the sectarianism and the sort of this exclusivity attitude and and the institutional uh it gets bogged down by institutions and lineages and and it's it like to create these hierarchies that it's don't created, it creates these hierarchies the that turn people off well okay if you're turning people off that means you're shooing them away from the dharma right don't do that don't yeah, do that exactly There's, right and you know it's so simple ways, like, yeah they talk about find like not eating onions in. and garlic it's like well why do you think what's well, because you don't have bad breath when you're telling them about the dharma that's the only reason there isn't some metaphysical well, why can't we eat these certain things? Because then your breath will stink and you'll turn people away from the Dharma. It's pretty simple. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So anything you're doing, no matter yeah. how mundane it and is, it if you're... will make you fart during a retreat. That's not good. <laughs> 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 yeah, you know? Well, there's some point to that. It all depends. You know? <laughs> yeah. Everything in its context. It's there's a relatability a factor, thing. but there's... A, yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's what i had one of, that was one of the funny jokes i had like right after awakening was like i was still smoking cigarettes at the time and i was having a cigarette i thought you know maybe i should keep this this is like a, a relatability approachability thing hey this guy knows suffering he understands let's talk to this guy about it yeah you know but you know i didn't do that but uh it's funny yeah. how that works you know if you can wear your suffering openly or your vulnerability or your humanness openly it, there's a relatability factor. There's an approachability. The more you're like, I'm a superhuman God figure. Well, I guess we can't approach him and talk to him about it then. Yeah. So the more casual and friendly and down to earth and ordinary we can keep it, the more approachable it is. I, I think spreads, there's a, I think. a real mistake in trying to make yourself look too important. I think, I think uh, being approachable and having a sense of humor. Yeah. Um, being friendly. Just, you know, yeah. being kind to everybody. You know, if somebody has a question, you know, try to answer it. Don't, don't uh, act like, you know, you don't use that as ammo it. to, oh, look yeah. how oh, much I know about this and you don't, or whatever it is. Someone yeah. else who knows. <laughs> yeah. How dare you ask such an entry level question around me or whatever? It's like, you know, Nam Kainer Boo, my root, to root teacher, he um, has thousands of students around the world, right? Hmm. And every once in a while I had, I needed to know something from him and I'd send him an email. He'd get right back to me and answer the questions. 
Yeah, he's got exactly. Thousands of students right, around the world, right. and he always got back to me. I, I don't remember a single time where he didn't get that's back important. to me. That's that's something that I, I view as very important that I try to uh, exemplify is to be available. Yeah. To be casually available, you know, in every format. And also, if somebody has a question, I'm not going to dance around it, wear my armor of pretty words. No, you can't touch me. He, he, he. No, no, I'm going to directly answer the question. That's what they want. Yeah. Why wouldn't you do and that? Okay Why play a game it? about it? I yeah. don't know. Yeah. 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 That too. Sometimes people ask me a very specific question. That. Listen, that's not, <laughs> that's not my thing. That's not, I don't have direct experience with that. So I can't help mm -hmm. you with that. I'm not going to venture a guess because that's not part of my path. I'm not going to venture a guess, you mm -hmm. know? You have to find someone that knows about that. Like somebody the other day asked me about uh, the internal sound. I said, I don't know. It doesn't touch upon my experience. I'm not going to, I don't know, Google it. Find someone that knows about yeah. it. I don't know. <laughs> Compare notes. There's nothing wrong with that. I think, <laughs> I think people appreciate honesty when you say you don't know something. Transparency, you know? honesty about what this is like Very without important. hyping it or dampening it. Because so many people do that. Yeah, I, I don't hold anything back, you know, I, yeah. I try to, I try to be as honest as I possibly can with people. I, exactly. um, I you know, if I'm going to uh, teach somebody something like a meditative practice, I'll explain it, you know, why I do this or what it's all about, yeah. or, you know, what is the right. basis of that? Um, you know, it's just very important to me to do that because, uh, the transparency I, aspect is, is key, I think. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, since I've uh, written my two books, I've I've been contacted by so many people. It's just it's just crazy. That's awesome. But I love it. I mean, yeah. I'm like, okay, you know, if I can help you, I will. Yeah. You know, if I can, if I if I can give you some. It's the most enjoyable I activity I can think of. I mean, uh, that's why you I know, came like, back to life. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's that's what it was all about. It was see all if right. I can help people. Yeah. Beautiful. I mean, that's that's bodhicitta. Yeah, it's not that complex, is it? It's no, pretty simple. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's pretty simple. It's not. Uh, it's, there's nothing secret about it. It's available for everybody, and it's the key to everything. It's what we are too. You know, it's it's. There's not like we have to muster it up. It's part of the fabric of what we are. That's we're who inherently we really are. loving when we when we yep. discover the true self. There's yep. just the deeper yep. you. Uh, the deeper you can inhabit and align with the truth of your own true self, of your own Buddha nature, it's just effortless. This happens. It's just the sun just, the sun just shines, the grass just grows, and the sage just pours forth unconditional love. It's just what it does. On its I mean, own. We spend a lot of time trying to live a dark life, mm. trying to move away from the light. Now, you can't truly move away from the light, but you can apparently move away from the light. This yeah. is something you can do uh, through, you know, through um, unsavory actions. You know, it, it can be by, ha by cultivating uh, disturbing emotions, anger, fear, uh, you know, jealousy. These things move you, apparently move you away from the light. So you can dispel those things to awaken, which means you're opening yourself up to the light. And it just dispels all that. So, um, you know, that's kind of, kind of part of this understanding of what awakening actually is. And, and, you know, what is this thing we do where we, you know, we do self-destructive things like, you know, becoming right. drug addicts or, or, um, you know, picking on people or, um, you know, being very frightened about everything. Mm. You know, these types of things are, um, they're, they're helping to cultivate uh, darkness. Yeah. Rather cultivating than ignorance like, rather than cultivating clarity. Ignorance yeah. rather than putting clarity. on masks rather than yeah and opening everything up yeah it's not like you're going anywhere it's kind of like you're putting you're sitting in one spot putting mask after mask on yeah or you're taking mask after mask off you know it's right. a, the right. same things the directionality thing yeah yeah 
Yeah, have you seen that uh, movie with uh, by Zhang Sarkiense that has to do with a lot of masks? I haven't seen it yet, but I I read a little bit about it, and I I'm very intrigued. I want to I want to watch. Never even heard movie. of it. No, it's news. To yeah, me. that's cool. He's, uh, he does movies every once in a while. He's a, you know who that Zhang Sarkiense is? He's very he's very famous so. uh, Buddhist master. Hmm. Um, but anyhow, it's uh, I'll have to. I'll have to look that up. I can. I'll. I'll text yeah, you or something. For sure. What that is. Yeah, that'd be yeah. cool. <laughs> it's just funny that you mentioned masks. That's what I thought. Yeah. Thought about right away. So yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. Do you want me to read a poem from my book? Yeah. Sure. So so, in and I have 112 poems in here. But this one, every chapter starts with a poem, starts and ends with a poem. So I thought I had picked a couple here. Um, from our discussion today about dreams and daily life, I have uh, chapter 15 is called Dreams and Daily Life. Uh -huh. <laughs> you can see that. So here is the poem from at the beginning. Shui, out of this Great expanse arises ultimate bodhicitta, awareness present in this instant, expanding, swirling, radiating supreme light appearances become clear. There is no difference between dreams and daily life. All objects of mind, empty illusions dance before us, emptiness appearing, manifesting, empty as emptiness, seeing all, as illusion, may great waves of benefit be generated for all sentient beings. Oma hung, Oma hung, Oma hung. Oma hung, hung, Very nice. Beautiful. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. So, you know, like I say, this is all about spiritual practice. <laughs> and so I found that uh, poetry is just very. Um, especially you know writing poetry especially is just a wonderful spiritual practice in and of itself because you can really get to the feeling of those ideas energy, not just yeah. the ideas the energy of it and so then that that can kind of manifest uh, that way so um so i Beautiful. started each chapter and ended each chapter with something like that <laughs> Very nice. You know, and it, it kind of breaks you out of the Most logical of mind, too, because the, the conscious mind is so rigid and logical that the poetry can invite the the other hemisphere or the intuitive, you know, yeah, yep. balances it out a bit. I like that. It's good. Yeah. It helps reset with each chapter. It's like an energetic reset before you dive into the next one. That's yeah. what I was. Yeah, that's exactly what I was doing. I was I was like, OK, now reset because i have like cleansing your palate serious... when you're wine tasting you know yeah <laughs> <Something> like that <laughs> yeah i have um i have chapters in there that, that uh one of them is called hundreds of demons another one's called millions of demons mm. now, these are things you face <laughs> in spiritual yeah, practice yeah. so right. now you need to reset you can't just, <laughs> you can't just like, go down this this dark hole of despair we have to reset yeah 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 <laughs> i'm gonna leave on that doing. note yeah yeah leave on that note oh wait there's hundreds of pages left <laughs> keeps going keeps going <laughs> wow yeah yep. so but anyhow that was the recurring theme is always you know going back to that uh, compassion going back to bodhicitta now the the first syllable that i said shri uh that is that's what that means is is evoking compassion so that's if you've ever learned that in tibetan buddhism that's uh that's something that we learned through uh, avalokiteshvara practices but uh, among others but uh, that was an armed that's, buddha of compassion Yes, actually, an actual disciple of uh, Buddha Shakyamuni. Uh, so very nice. Yes. <laughs> so the great excellent Buddha of compassion or Bodhisattva of compassion. Um, 
His Holiness the Dalai Lama is considered an emanation of Avalokiteshvara. So doesn't mean he's the only one because when you're in when you start talking about emanations it could be a million yeah exactly, <laughs> so, exactly. but people talk about him that way and he was very important to me uh in my spiritual practice so i i have a very uh very great fondness for his holiness the dalai lama yeah i've, I've i feel very connected to certain figures like uh bodhidharma ikyu talopa milarepa and um, mm -hmm. I feel like that, like one of the rays of that great being, you know. You, you so, uh, mentioned the Bodhidharma, Talopa, and Milarepa. I have, I have great, great, great fondness for all three. <laughs> no wonder we're connecting. Oh, well, eh? yeah. I, I, you <laughs> I know, some of my, uh, one of my teachers is a Zen Buddhist. And so I, I, I benefited greatly from his teachings. So, you know, Soto Zen. And then I recall past lives when I was a Zen practitioner as well. So. Yeah, I have a really strong foundation in Zen originally that kind of uh, morphed into a kind of a Vajrayana, Sogchen, Kriya Yoga. Yeah. And, and Advaita, Vedanta and stuff like that. Um, yeah. But yeah, I always used to talk about it. I used to say it more as a seeker, you know. I would talk mm -hmm. very cryptically and poetically about this very topic. Yeah. And I would say things like, I am the sound of Bodhidharma's shoe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I am Talopa's snapping fingers. I am Ikyu's uh -huh. red thread, things like that, you know. Uh -huh. that, that's oh, the feeling is like I'm some small part of some great being, and that, that the energetic signature here is in part one aspect of that is these, these emanations from these, these past masters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, some oh. level of subtle identification but only to a part of that or something yeah well through guru yoga practice we discover that we really are not separate from our gurus yeah so you know um one of the things that i did with um learning about past lives was sort of uh learning to um uh deconstruct this person that i am mm, deconstruct yeah. and reconstruct deconstruct and like deity yoga in the japanese and the tibetan formats where you the aggregates or whatever the yeah you can see what the, constitutes personhood the pattern the 12, that creates person 12 lengths of interdependence so so when we we look at a person you know what what how come there's a person well we can't exist without absolutely everything else mm. in the universe that has ever existed. Absolutely everything. Yeah. The way I put it is they have one atom without a this. place. None of this yeah, would be. So, yeah. so, so this sort of practice of, of deconstructing and reconstructing, mm. you start to realize how everything is connected, everything's related. I and then you start to, these past lives start to, you start to pay attention to these past lives leading to this life take them away put them back together take them away put them back together you know it's kind of like milarepa building the tower and tearing it yeah. down and then building it again you know I... it's the same thing you know and and so you start to see why why is this like this you know why am i like this why yeah. why is this happening why am i facing this you know, so you take it apart, put it back together, take it apart, put it back together. And you, you start to see the, the minute details. Yeah. There's how something, that works. When you're talking about that, something subtle happened. I like saw a deeper insight in a more subtle way. I like that. It's really good. It's powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good. good. Yeah. It's good stuff. Uh, and I just did that, you know, personal meditation. I just sort of learned how to do that. That was my next question yeah. was going to be essentially like if you what would you recommend to me specifically what would you recommend to people in general what would you recommend to a beginner level seeker would it all be the same with regard to how to access past life memory you said is this kind of remembering back further and further is there an art or a trick or a is there an important part there that would be a powerful key to that well um i uh 
was practicing dream yoga. So the way I did it, I mean, there's, there's numerous, there are numerous ways to do it, but I was practicing dream, dream yoga, which begins with lucid dreaming. Okay. So, so you develop lucid dreaming and then you start to practice the Dharma within your dreams. And so, um, I, I learned, uh, about the, uh, different, different practices within dreams. So within dreams, um, and, and you'll hear this from, you know, not, you know, not just me, but you'll hear this from other people who practice dream yoga, you encounter wisdom beings within, Mm. within dreams. Like Dakinis and things like that. Dakinis and great masters. Past masters. Yep. And, uh, so, you know, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, you can, you can encounter whoever you need. And so, um, I, I found some practices, um, some Dakinis actually, uh, communicated how to, how to do this to me, you know, with, uh, through meditative practice. And, and it was, um, a little hard to explain because the, the transmission was, was kind of, um, very disturbing at first because I didn't understand what was happening. It had to do with emptiness and, and sort of getting to understand this, this deconstruction of self and reconstruction of self understanding. So it was viewed as a threat because you didn't necessarily know there was yep. going to be a reconstruction. Yeah. Yep. So, so I, I, um, I learned this was, this was years before my near death experience, by the way. So it was, it was something that, um, was this I after had, or before what we might call stream entry, the original, the, you know, initial non-dual, um, awakening just before, it was after probably, or... uh, probably part of, uh, it was sort of, uh, synchronous with my understanding of emptiness. So the, the Dakinis through, uh, dream yoga, I was learning about emptiness and that was not just one dream. It was a series of dreams, but I started to practice. I, and I used to be, um, you know, so serious that I, I'd wake up at four in the morning and practice until the very last moment, you know, so I could was get that before you discovered it. the tantric kind of, uh, like Vajrayana approach, the I expedited would... catalytic energetic kind of transmission side of things? Um, I was, I would say it was sort of at the beginning of when I was starting to learn about that, uh, when I was beginning non practices. So I would, you know, I'd wake up in the early morning, I was getting hardly any sleep and I was waking up in the early morning and, and I'd practice in the dark by myself and, uh, you know, until I had to go to work and, um, and, uh, weekends I'd practice for hours every day, you know, many hours a day. And, um, but I learned, um, this, this practice of sort of trying to loosen up this sense of self, you know, the, the, the current life, you know, you cling to this current life. So I learned this, uh, practice through dream yoga. And it was basically what you do is you, um, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the, when you're paying attention to breath with with like shamatha practice it's you're you're supposed to breathe quietly yeah okay this was breathing noisily like the sound Uh, of waves coming and going from a beach like if you've ever been up to lake superior and you sit on the beach and there's gravel and it's oh okay yeah so you're i'm you breathe sort of like that really loud i don't know how the speaker is carrying that but um so I would breathe in, here I am, I breathe out, and I'm expanded to the full extents of the universe. Then I breathe in, here I am, and breathe out. Now I'm not only the full extents of the universe, but all path, all past lifetimes back here so it's the you know really thinking about the the uh, interdependence of of all phenomenon and what creates this appearance and so reconstruct 
deconstruct, you know, do that with the, kind of a noisy breath. Yeah. <clears throat> and I would do that for a long time and really contemplate this, this appearance of self and then deconstruct it and really try to understand the emptiness of that. So even like my altar, you know, it was kind of like a, a Tibetan altar, but I had a little crystal uh, offering bowls and, and, you know, because, uh, you know, it, they're transparent. Right? Yeah, yeah, nice. <laughs> and so I was really trying to explore this idea of emptiness. And so kind of doing it in that way and then, um, you know, deconstructing and reconstructing self, I started it this i sort of lost my grip on this this sense of this current life and started letting it go and when i started letting it go you just kind of slip into this knowledge of past lives wow and so so then that that just kind of um appears and so even though you can see these past lives you you still treat that like it's a you know, like that's also a fabrication, right? So not treating it like it's something absolutely solid and real, but sort of seeing the illusory nature of it, seeing the emptiness of these phenomenon. And so I would just practice in that way. And it sort of helped to loosen up my memories and, and these memories would start to, um, you know, so I, I'd be able to start seeing past lives a lot more clearly as, as you're saying that what i'm what's arriving in my mind is basically like emptiness being the shared heart you know of these different appearances it's almost like that's the mm. uh, i'm just guessing it's more of a question than a statement i'm just uh it's what's arising here it's like is is it the case that the direct access to that emptiness as the shared heart of those arisings somehow strings them into the same it's like is that is that the the key is that the access point that allowed you to see that was just dropping into the emptiness so deeply but then how do you what what would separate that from regular you know soak chen effortless non-meditation mm -hmm. eyes open type experience so um i i think the heart of it is bodhi, still bodhicitta mm. um but the the thing about emptiness is the more we understand emptiness, the more we develop clarity about ultimate bodhicitta. Mm -hmm. So to actually truly understand emptiness, we're, we have to understand ultimate bodhicitta because emptiness is not just void or nothing. Emptiness is actually that radiant yeah. awareness that is not a thing yeah. but it's it's all pervasive it's everywhere it is this uh great compassion that goes beyond what we would normally consider compassion right it's, it's unconditional it, like it's even unconditional being it's a human all is a good. condition yeah <laughs> right. yeah it it's yeah. when the all good starts to manifest through awareness yeah so then we start to see how how this these appearances are all good yeah so now the judging mind is sort of like something that we would fall back into where we would say well this is good and this is bad right. and we're not sure about this okay well just good bad and not sure those are the three poisons <laughs> yeah. yeah there you go yeah. yeah so so when we say the all good that's not that's not the same as being poisoned by, you know, just right, attracted, right. attraction the, for the everything. The background cosmic goodness, yeah, it's, not, not it's, the mind judgment is a good thing. It's yeah. seeing the, uh, the equanimity mm. that's all pervasive through all phenomenon, all beings, all phenomenon. So when we deconstruct ourselves and reconstruct ourselves, we start to see that emptiness more clearly and and then you know this emptiness practice um starts to bodhicitta naturally uh starts to increase 
by understanding emptiness, it starts to increase. So it's a good way to avoid the tra trap of nihilism is to just really examine yourself and see, you know, how is bodhicitta in your life? How yeah. is it in your awareness? So if, if you're just sort of looking at everything sort of with contempt because everything's nothing, you know, Bitterness. you know, we've seen that. <laughs> it's like, it's like, and I've even experienced that. I'm going to yeah. go ahead and admit it. You know, right. I started to understand emptiness. I, I experienced oh, yeah, that yeah. For, from yeah, time the, to time. The, the idea they always realized, say, they no, say that's not right. Is, I felt, just fell into a trap say, here. Emptiness is not your friend and it's not your enemy. It's usually the shunyata is not, it's not your enemy, but it's also not your friend. Like, careful. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. it's not your best buddy. Don't run toward it too quickly. Yep. But that is the direction to lean toward. But, you know. Yep not your buddy it's not your enemy it's <laughs> what that. it is you know it's i love that that's great <laughs> <laughs> not your enemy but also not your buddy <laughs> yeah like, you know he's not yeah it's not your lover you know it's the absence of all other <laughs> but uh it's uh, sort of the understanding the equanimity is not sort of like saying, okay, you and you and you and you and you and, and, and an infinite number of everyone else, you're not equal. I mean, not saying that you're equal, but saying you're all the same. Yeah. You're all one taste. Right, the same sameness. Our Probably. real condition self-liberates. We're already free. Yeah. We're already Buddhas. Yeah. It's just that for whatever reason, we we're don't fixated see that, on not yeah. being a Buddha. <laughs> mm -hmm. We're fixated on causing problems for ourselves. Yeah. We don't need to do that. Yeah. There's no point to it, but we do it. We, we make a special effort to do that for yeah. some strange reason. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, it's I funny. It's like, it's out. like, it's like, this is, um, what we call this world. It's almost like emptiness running away from itself, but emptiness embracing itself at the same time. And it's, it's mm -hmm. so beyond like the real depth of non-duality is just that it's so beyond the word concepts we could use that none of them touch it. And right. um, so it's, you know, the whole emptiness and form thing, it's like, well, it's beyond all of that. It's because yeah. um, what is emptiness without the juxtaposition of something in reference to it, you know? Right. But I, I, I really like, you know, the concept of Rigpa because it comes very close. It's like those same metaphors that they use in Sogchen, they also use it in Faith of Vedanta and things like that because they're so helpful. Mm -hmm. You know, a crystal ball. And it's always clear or a mirror, but it's technically the mirror is always empty. There's nothing in the mirror, you know, and whatever's in front of it. So it's yeah. funny because sometimes people get the wrong idea. That, oh, well, you're just trying to get rid of the mental contents. Like, no, there's only Rigpa. There's only Christine mm -hmm. awareness. Right. Yeah, we don't. It's a mistake to, uh, well, they call it Ma Rigpa to, to, mm -hmm. to seek the state without thoughts. Uh, and that's a trap also. Right. Exactly. Yeah. That's um, the other side of that. No, going. no, yeah. no thoughts. That's, uh, that's some, and that's one of those traps we can fall into that, uh, might be hard to get out of actually, because we're, yeah. We Cause it's so right enjoyable thing. too. Right. Like I have friends yeah. that, uh, I have a thought in my head. <laughs> I have, I have friends that would, they would, you know, they were potent sages and they, they would wake up and <clears> some <throat> of them would just, you know, sit there and space out in emptiness for hours on end every day for months and months and months until they kind of came back, you know, full circle. And um, well, I, I from their I, perspective, it was so intensely enjoyable that uh, it just happened. It's yeah. like, like an, a spontaneous yeah, I, drug addiction or something, but to emptiness. <laughs> have you done that in meditation where, where you're meditating and just everything loses meaning? I mean, somebody could have just. Oh yeah, the, if they start talking or something. Yeah, right yeah, exactly. Yeah, it just, it just yeah. wouldn't it would be nothing. Yeah. I mean, that was so, one of the hallmarks I, I to the awakened experience here. Just problem. immediately upon it happening, there's just. I think we have a delay going on. Sorry, what were you saying? No, that's okay. No, I was just saying that uh, that it can be a mistake if it, you know in meditation if we think that that's. Mm you know that that's the desired thing state or something yeah awareness is being keenly uh present in every moment yeah keenly content or not it does change it energy. yeah rigpa is really you're 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 spending 24 7 you know including your dreams yeah, yeah. 
aware of that that awakened energy the, right, right. the awakened state you you know it's sort of like like being aware of a bright light mm. that's constantly on and then but because always, it's always on you start to forget that it's there that's maybe well, that's, that's why because it's always on the, we overlook it yeah that's the trick but then but then if you start to deal with the energy the Sambhogakaya dimension you start to deal with the energy then you can maintain more of that awareness mm. and so i this is why yeah. uh, a person even when they've received Dzogchen teachings they have to keep practicing because the, you know to fully awaken uh you have to become a master of all of the energies and all of the you yeah. have to be aware of that uh dharmakaya light at all times and and you have to learn to be in the moment present and aware no matter what happens you have yeah. to have that awareness tend to it with yeah awareness. so there yeah. is a practice to it even though it's a very simple practice it's just yeah it's just Whatever. um it's just that you're you're constantly maintaining that presence and you can go deeper and deeper into contemplation with that uh with that presence and um you know there'll be no problem you know yeah but you know if it's kind of like when you start to do that you can go into deep contemplation and okay now you shouldn't be driving a car <laughs> <laughs> you know? Oh, you should not go outside the front door because you're going to walk into a tree or something. Yeah, there's not enough ego to function at that level. Yeah, <laughs> right. So make sure your physical. Right. You're not... yeah. I always thought that was funny. Like yeah. the yogis, they would be yeah. sitting on a tiger skin. Yeah, and it's like uh, to me that was always the same thing. It's like if you're totally zonked out, totally spaced out, totally blissed out in a non-functional way, where a tiger could eat you. Now the tiger approaches you and says, okay, wait a minute. This primate's sitting on a tiger's skin. Maybe I'll leave this one alone. You know? <laughs> like that's where that came from. You're so gone in that state yeah, yeah. that if a tiger tried to eat you, you wouldn't fight it. You know, type of deal. Right. So because of that, you need to sit on a tiger's skin to scare off the other animals. The other animals are like, okay, this guy killed a tiger and is sitting on its skin? Let's yeah. not fuck with this guy, just in case. You know? <laughs> if, if only they thought about things that much. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, you know, like on an instinctual level. Right. I'm sure that makes a statement. No, you know? I think uh, I think when when a person becomes fully enlightened, um, <clears throat> they would there'd be no problem with a tiger or fire or water or anything. None of the elements could affect you. You know, you'd be able to manipulate all of the energy and really the matters you nothing that would be energy. That you, you realize that you're the immaterial behind it so in that sense it wouldn't matter what happened to the body because you no longer identified as it. it would be the other or, side of that or a tiger might just run right through you and, and you'd be able to not be touched by the tiger or um like for instance um nam kai narbu said you know and he's got many very wonderful students who are very advanced practitioners um and you know some sometimes they will approach him and wonder if they're a deity or maybe they've reached enlightenment full enlightenment and he said well there's a simple test for that just light a candle and hold your hold your hand over the candle and if it if there's no problem okay you're 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 fully enlightened if you've got a problem with if you have to pull your hand away <laughs> keep practicing <laughs> i always love that one because you know because it's like it it's so humbling you know because it's yeah. sort of like like we we do get sort of uh immersed in our in our uh yams or experiences yeah. we have these wonderful experiences through spiritual practice and if we cling to those spiritual practices we can get uh, a little bit too you know clingy yeah. and it can it can become an obstacle that's another right. trap so we want to make sure that we don't um like make too much out of our spiritual practices uh and and you know really look at what what's going on here and you know don't give up spiritual practice because you had a good day right you know? right <laughs> <laughs> no now you have to have, an, have another good keep day and fresh. another good day yeah yeah exactly keep it going yeah, yeah. that's like what i said 
what I said when I was uh, introduced to the nature of mind at my Dzogchen uh, uh, um, pointing out, I said to people, well, now the real challenge has begun. Mm. This is, this is a yeah. big deal. And they looked at me like, what? Yeah. You know, cause I, up until that point, you know, through the Vajrayana, you know, the, the Hinayana Mahayana Vajrayana, you know, it's a big deal. It's a lot of work. It's a lot, a lot of things to take in. Yeah. And then, then now I get to Dzogchen, which is practice of the nature of mind. I said, no, this is now the challenge has begun. And, and people yeah. didn't understand that, but the reason that's the challenge is because remaining present in that awareness, we're constantly distracted mm -hmm. and, and it's so easy to become attached to this or that or the other thing. Even the idea of being enlightened, it becomes an attachment. Yeah. So we have to let that go, you know, right. as well, so that it doesn't become an obstacle for us. Totally. So, which yeah. all these obstacles are demons, you know, that's kind of funny that these things can be limits, you know, it's like, well, an enlightened guy wouldn't do that. So I can't do that. You know, like, that's a limit. Yeah, right? yeah. It's like, well, how free are you? So it all becomes a demonstration of, yeah. Well, how fucking free are you really? Can yeah. you curse? Can you not curse? Like, what is it? Where? Where? <laughs> well, where, well when, you're, the... when you're beginning, you should probably shouldn't curse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just in case. <laughs> yes. So, so yeah, it's not a, uh, it's it's not a disqualifier in reality. <laughs> if a person curses, I do try not to curse. I've noticed uh, that in the Buddhist but, community. Is that is that because of like a you don't want to like stir up the negative emotions that would be surrounding that. Like I'm assuming yeah, that's what it is. That's that's what it is for me. Um, I I led meditate groups in meditation for a few years, and uh, I thought, well, I should probably make sure I conduct myself in a way that doesn't put anybody off. So I just I made see. sure that yeah, I, I yeah. watched my mouth. <laughs> it's not yeah. that I'm. Uh, it's not that I have never cursed. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's just that i didn't want to give somebody that impression you know trying to keep the invitation as open to as wide of an yeah. audience as possible i, mean, I try not to become precise. an obstacle yes yeah. beautiful <laughs> <laughs> well i just realized what time it is i do have another talk scheduled for now but uh Ooh, always okay. uh always an honor and a pleasure to talk to you sir yes. always uh, very insightful wow i can't believe two much. hours already whoa yeah i get that a lot <laughs> It was very it's fun good, though it's always enjoyable and always uh you know energy exchange always a sense of ease always very insightful very clear and yeah you know anyone yeah. looking for your book out there we got both of them out yeah. now we got the frog out yeah. as well so frog and uh, timeless luminosity dive into this a little deeper yeah absolutely available on That's amazon <laughs> beautiful and i'll i'll put when i eventually publish this video i'll end up putting the links in the description as well so people can directly find that the Amazon books there for you and everything. And uh, yeah, Perfect. sounds good. Well, well thanks thank so much, you, man. Andrew, you are so fun to talk to. I really oh, appreciate you too. this. <laughs> always, always, always a pleasure. Yeah. Thanks so much. All right. Bye-bye. Talk to you soon. <laughs> bye. Yep. Bye.